So um, by way of, of starting our conversation about coastal pollution, I wanted to talk more generally to you guys. And so my question to you is, what is pollution? Nasty, says Aspen. Uh, Amber, what's your definition of, of uh, pollution? Okay, so, so a couple, let's write a couple of those ideas down. So you said, you said, uh, you said abnormal was one idea you had. Another you had this idea of toxic. Okay. Um, Michaela, what, what's a, what's a, what's your definition of pollution? What is pollution to you? It's something that's in the environment that's not supposed to be there. Okay. The on that. Okay, good. Not supposed to be there. Anybody else? Any other? Do you guys have a, a, your own definition or, or thoughts as to how we could define pollution? Humans. Yeah. Humans are pollution? Is that what you're saying? <laughs> <laughs> Something humans did. Okay, so, so pollution is somehow anthropogenic. Okay, so so far we have abnormal, toxic, not supposed to be there. Uh, somehow associated with people, anthropogenic. Anything else? Okay, so this is the best definition we have uh, of pollution, something that's not supposed to be there. Um, the things you guys talked about are very common in terms of how we think about them in our pr daily practice. Something that's toxic, something that's you know uh, uh, caused by people, right? So uh, we could imagine the case where a giant asteroid fell out of the sky, hits a mountain, throws up all this uh, soil into fine dust particles, and then chokes the deer. You know, we can breathe, right? That's not human, but we would probably say that's, that's, a, that's a pollutant, right? That, that's, that's messing with stuff. So, so this idea of, of what is supposed to be there quote unquote, the long term average, the background within a particular range of, of concentrations of stuff. Okay. So from this definition, um, if we had a, well, I'll, I'll hold that for a second. Okay, so, so let's have a look at some of our, you guys are collecting this data right now. We'll have additional data. We actually have way more data than this. This is just from a, a couple years. I just grabbed a slide here to illustrate this. We will see if the data you guys collect over the next few weeks uh, fits in with this. I have a strong suspicion it will, but you know, maybe I'm wrong. But this is one of our questions wherein we've gone around and we've asked, again, this is just for Santa Barbara, Ventura, and Los Angeles counties, but we've asked people, uh, one of your questions is to rank the threats, right? Uh, in this case, I think this was rank the threats to the coastal zone or, or however we worded it. <clears throat> and so we've given them, oh, sorry, yeah, no, it's right there, yeah. So the coastal zone is the first one, threats to wetlands on uh, the uh, line right below that. And then we also ask it in the context of fisheries. In fisheries, we add a couple extra flavors. So for our, our default one, we ask about, uh, you know, we're saying rank them one through four. A pollution, uh, ecological fragmentation or habitat destruction, excessive harvesting, what we might call over-harvesting, and then uh, the introduction of non-native species, species that aren't, uh, wouldn't have been there without uh, humans' activity. And then we have all those things when we, when we ask the question about fisheries, but we also add in two additional flavors, acidific, ocean acidification and warming uh, oceans, war, war, uh, increased temperatures. In the context of uh, today's conversation, and, and probably I would argue, well, let me hold that for a second. I'll ask you a question in a second. So l l let's just look at the top line here. So coastal uh, threats. In this case, the lowest number is the closest to rank one. So the lowest number is what people would say is the greatest risk. 
the largest number, the closest to four, is going to be the, the least worrisome of the lot to the general public. And so what do we see? We see that pollution consistently ranks as the perceived number one threat to the coastal zone. If we ask about uh, wetlands, it consistently is the number one. And so, so I, 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 in other words, I, I meld, I've melded all this data. I've melded you know, several years worth of data. But if we go year by year, if we go county by county, if we go whatever, it, it, it pretty much follows the same exact pattern, which is pollution number one and then everything else. And, and sometimes the, 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 the ranks of the other two things maybe shifts a little teeny bit, but, um, but consistently people think exotic species aren't a problem or, or me, are the least worrisome of the blot and pollution is by far the, the most worrisome. What do you guys think about that? Does that make sense to you? Does, do you agree with that? What do you think? It, 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 makes, it makes sense that people would say that? Okay, but then Aspen, you said that, but you don't know if you'd agree with it, and why, why would you not agree with that? Well, from what I'm more fragmentation, So outright destruction yeah. of yeah. ecosystems, okay. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Any other thoughts? That's right. That's right. That's right. So, so um, by our general definition of pollution, non-native species are one form of a pollutant, right? A biological pollutant. Uh, if, but if I just if I just ask you guys, pollution or pollutant, or maybe what about this? What what if I ask your neighbor, uh, name a pollutant? What would they say? Okay. Okay. If you ask your non-ESRM neighbor, non-ESRM major neighbor, I don't know how to say this. Whatever. If you you're, you're buying something at the store tonight, and you turn around, ask him or her. Uh, we say pollution. What do you think of? What, what do you think they're gonna say? They're gonna say chemicals, right? They're probably gonna say something, you know, some synthetic chemical, maybe a pesticide. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So uh, par particles in the air. Thanks, VW. <laughs> Bastards. Um, right, so that kind of stuff, right? Uh, things coming from human uh, chemical creations or the result of specific industrial activities, that's the classic thing that most people think of, right? So soot in the air, CO2, um, some kind of plastic, right? Some trash, yeah, something that we created to put our lunch in and then it blew away. I, I have to confess, I was really embarrassed uh, last week. Last last was it last week? Is last week I was driving up Lewis Road and it was crazy hot and I rolled my windows down and I had a plastic bag in the car and it blew out of the. Shame. I know I'm a bastard. I know. <laughs> I know. So uh, I was like, man, and I was like, do I pull over and like cause a massive accident and kill people? I'm like, no. But then I'm watching the thing and it's like, what is that movie, American Beauty? I'm like things dancing over the road. I'm like, man, I'm evil. <laughs> anyway. Um, so yeah, so we think that's what we think about in terms of pollution, right? Those kinds of things, plasticky stuff, um, um, organophosphates, that kind of stuff, and th and that's that's natural. I mean, I mean that that, that that's what we're schooled in thinking, um, but by our more generic definition, that that totally is pollution, but that is but one flavor of pollution. So we can so exotics would fall within that um, within that. Uh, rubric, but so would ocean, so would, um, I would argue, ocean temperature, so would uh, ocean acidification, right? We oftentimes, what's that? Buildings, sure, possibly, yeah. So if we're talking about the airspace for birds, and now we got a bunch of uh, concrete and glass obstructions in the way, that could be considered a pollutant, potentially. Um, <clears throat> Because of the scale of climate change and, and the magnitude of the impact and the ubiquitousness of the impact, um, a lot of times people will ask about pollution 
or climate change. And I would posit that that's really just a subset. Uh, you know, uh, the CO2 that we're emitting, the methane that we're emitting is a type of pollution. And yes, it's causing some bad things, but that's really uh, conceptually no different than if we polluted a, 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 we dumped a bunch of crud in a river, right? And the fact that that, that messed up river is having ecological consequences. But, but, um, but for, for obvious reasons, a lot of people break that off as separate. But anyway, so, so look, at, we, we find this over and over again. People have found this since the 60s and the 70s. Then we ask people, what are the threats to, let's say, the environment or to your health or to the you know, provisioning of, of food from the natural environment? Everybody runs to pollution. So why, why do you guys think that is? Because uh, I think it's the thing that people care about the most. Like, that's the, <clears throat> like, even though it's the news. Okay, so, so, so it's in the news. So, so one reason is it's in, the, it's in the news. And then keep going. Oh, it's just the number one thing that people talk about with environmental. Okay, okay, so, so um, plastic bags that I threw, that I didn't throw out, let's be honest, but it ac <laughs> accidentally blew out. My car. Um, uh, you can see that, right? I can go take a picture of that. I can put it in a news story, or I can visually see that it's accumulating in the drainage ditches alongside the road. And I'm like, oh man, that's that that's obvious to my son, to your old grandma. That's obvious that that probably shouldn't be there, right? That 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 McDonald's wrapper shouldn't be in that national park, kind of thing, right? Okay, so those are obvious reasons. What else? What, what, else, what else might be driving um, people's uh, uh, high prioritization of pollution? My, I just have a case of people, so maybe. Oh, I'm sorry, you're aware of their lifestyle? What was people the last People are aware that their lifestyle is wasteful. Oh, it's wasteful, okay. So maybe as a collective, unconsciously, everything is aware that they're doing something that's wasteful. Okay. Um, Okay, so, so, so sort of some sense that there's some kind of guilt there going on or something, and, and everybody associates themselves with pollution. Okay, that's Amber's thought. Any, anybody else agree with that or disagree? Yeah. I agree, but I was going to say, um, especially with like fragmentation and exotics, those are things that sometimes we want. Like we want our cute little kitten. You know, think okay. of it as a bad thing. Yeah, good. Okay, let me write these down. Okay, so we, got, we have... We have um, uh, uh, it's, so uh, visibility slash uh, news, so people are hearing about it. We have there is something about responsibility from Amber, and then <clears throat> Aspen was just saying um, um, a uh, shared agreement. On the downsides, maybe? Yeah, because it's, it's easier to, you know, say, okay, well, you know, fabrication is bad, but we still need to build stuff, or exotics are bad, but we still, you know, need these critters to, you know, right. whatever they do. For right, the right. And so we see the upside. There's a, I mean, not, maybe we would say not a huge upside, but, but you could see a developer would say, hey, if we fragment this, sure, it's fragmenting the forest, but then we're getting all these yeah. houses. Or we can mitigate or whatever. Right. Is like, okay, it's bad no matter what. Okay, okay. You're in DC, crayfish. Ah, you're like, right. You're like, oh, cute, that's so cool, we have crayfish. You know, some people just don't know. If my kids didn't know, uh -huh. we'd pull them out and freeze them. I mean, that's fun for us, but... <laughs> Okay, so the pharaohs did not have McDonald's wrappers, right? <laughs> That's pretty obvious, right? So that so there was there were not uh, fast food containers on the side of the road in ancient Greece, right? There's probably other stuff on the side of the road, but but it, w it wasn't that it wasn't that, right? So okay, good. So th there's some level of obviousness, some level of not needing statistics, some level of not needing natural history training to learn the difference between this species of fish and that species of fish, right? So, so there's something a little more, uh, a little more gut. You know, George W. Bush would kind of get it, right? There's pollution by it, right? That kind of thing. Okay. All right. Good. So that, that that's probably playing into it. Anything else you guys can think of? I think it's like probably easier to understand how to fix it. Okay. Good. So, so, it, it, so it's both clearly bad, and at least in theory, 
an easy uh, solution, right? In the sense of uh, uh, just don't, okay, if, we, if, we, if we're using the example of trash, don't throw your trash on the ground, right? And in theory, that shouldn't cost anybody a lot of money. In theory, it shouldn't cost a lot of people a lot of time, uh, in, in theory, right? <clears throat> okay, any other, any other thoughts? These are good, I, I like all these thoughts. Especially because we don't know what the answer is. <laughs> so so, so this, has been, this, is a, this is a widely debated topic as to why this is, or not widely, well, that's, that's, see, that, those are the circles I travel in. Some people, a small subset of our society worries about these things. And those people, they're, they're, it's not entirely clear what the, what the answer is. But I think uh, uh, what Mandy was saying touches on one of the key aspects, this easiness. So do you, do any of you guys ever, have any of you guys ever made a McDonald's wrapper? <laughs> right, right. Have any of you ever made a petrochemical? Right, right. Um, <clears throat> you've probably all spread invasive species around, non weed seeds on your shoes and stuff, right? Um, you've probably uh, all consumed a food item that was maybe not sustainably harvested, right? And we can go through the list like that. I live in urban sprawl, right? My house is a relatively new house. So, so in a sense, I'm, I'm directly, not in a sense, I really am directly, at least short term, benefiting from destruction of habitat, right? But the, I also drive my car around. And my car is a hybrid because I'm a VSRM guy. But, <laughs> but, um, but, you know, so it, it, it does still pump out CO2, right? When I push my foot on the brake pedal, it makes friction with the brakes and a little bit of, of heavy metal come out of, comes out of that every time I do that. So a little bit of dust comes out and goes on the road bed every time, right? I'm contributing to that. But when we talk about pollution, we don't typically talk about the pollution from my house. What are those examples that we talked about? They are from the chemical company. They're from the oil company. They're from the manufacturing plant in China, right? So with, I think it's very easy for us to conceive of pollution as coming from not us. So you guys, the, 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 the notion that pollution is clearly bad and has an easy solution, it's an easy solution usually, usually for other people. We just got to put a thing on that smokestack. We just got to put a blah, 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 right? And so I think that's one of the reasons, I, I think all these reasons you guys have listed absolutely play a role. But I think that's a really underappreciated, uh, underappreciated role. So, if we talk about the example of water pollution, um, uh, to get a little more uh, narrow here for one second, we'll go blast back up in a second. But if we talk about water pollution, um, that would be any uh, physical thing, biological thing, uh, chemical thing um, that's going to change the water such that it would adversely impact critters. Okay, so we have our general definition of a, pollu of a pollutant, which is, which is, I think, useful that you should all have that, that broad idea in your head. But when we get to the actual management of the resource, we need a bit more specific, a bit, bit more specificity. So here we go. Here's a, here's a, a definition for water pollution. So it's something that's going to affect the living organisms. It's been a relatively recent invention that we worried about that we worry about organisms other than you and I, right? So historically, it would be bad if it made people, if it affected people's health or, or people's activity. But <clears throat> we would now say if it affected any life. Still, some people haven't gone all the way down that road. Some people would say, if it killed some bacteria or killed some mosquitoes, great. Yeah, get those mosquitoes out of here. But, but we'll, use, we'll start with this, uh, this concept. And then, of course, the natural uh, easy examples that probably pop in your head would be something like nutrients, right? Too, too much nitrogen, too much phosphorus, something like that in the water. 
uh, 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 tox some uh, byproduct of some industrial process that might get into the water somehow, maybe spill in the water, what have you. We could talk about, um, in, this, in this case, we could talk about an explosion of bacteria to the point where they would make, let's say, the fish sick or something like that. We could talk about other things. We could talk about uh, too much silt in the water, messing with, uh, say, light penetration so our photosynthetic organisms um, can't, can't photosynthesize, et cetera. Uh, what else? What are some other, let's see, do I have this one next? Okay, wait. Yeah. So what, what are some other examples of water pollution that you guys can think of? Or water pollutants, let me say it that way. Good, light. So, so, so either a decrease in light, classic example would be we have something, let's say a seagrass patch, and that seagrass needs re to be really uh, close to the surface, needs really high light, and then we put, a, we put a structure, a dock, a pier over that, and now those dudes are shaded. So they might be alive today, might be alive, whatever, next week, but over the course of several months, they're gonna not have that net positive uh, sugar balance and they're going to die. So we could cut it off or we could go the reverse. We could have too much light, right? So we could have sea turtles that want to be on a dark beach and need a dark beach to go and, and, and uh, you know, dig their, dig their burrows and this and that. And then we put up a bunch of lights by our hotel and that, that screws with, um, you know, the turtle's behavior and they don't lay eggs and stuff like that. Good. What else? Michaela? Noise pollution. Uh, noise. Yeah, great. Absolutely. Absolutely sound pollution. So, there's, so, um, so great. So these, the, thing I've, the few examples I've listed on this slide, that's the classic. Right? That's, what the, that's what the middle schooler would say. Or high, and those, those are real. Those aren't not real. But really, we're talking about the whole suite of things. So light, um, uh, uh, sound. What else? Yeah, thermal pollution, huge one. So um, when I was a, did I tell you guys about the leopard sharks at Catalina? Were they telling you guys that story? I was telling sense. Okay. Well, uh, we can tell you the full story later. But the short version is um, um, what we've discovered are in places that have a consistent, consistently different temperature signal. And while in theory you could be dumping ice cubes in the intertidal all day long, most people don't do that. So most typically. In our part of the world, we are adding, we're raising the temperature, so increased water temperature. And that's most typically associated with a power plant, right? So we, we, our power plants are essentially taking water, turning that water into steam. That steam is turning a turbine, and then, and, and then it's making electricity. But then we need to make that steam back into, you know, convert it back into liquid water, cool it down. We typically use water for that. We use river water, we use ocean water, we use estuary water. And, and we take that water and we run it through the, through the, the pipes and everything. And, and so we're uh, using that thermal mass that we talked about before, that, 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 that thermal inertia to bring the temperature in that smaller volume of power plant uh, pipe down. But then the water that we've taken from the sea has gotten a little bit warmer, and we, when we dump it out, it's, it's consistently warmer. Sometimes only a few degrees warmer. And you and I might, again, just like we talked about the, the, the thermocline and stuff, you and I might not see that as a massive difference. It can be a huge difference. So for example, if you want to see Baja fish, if you want to see fish that are common in Baja, you can go to the intertidal up in San Luis Obispo. Well, well, actually, you can't now because the world changed after 9-11. You can't go near the power plant. But, but if, you, if you could go near the discharge, for example, at Diablo Canyon, uh, you would find um, there are some butterfly fish up there. So what we would consider a tropical species that, that came up with, um, with El Nino, with, you know, with a warm water year just like this year, and they got established, and, they, and, and, and they're there. We have these critters, for example, all around. They're not, we wouldn't really probably call them exotic species, but they're, they're waifs, they're, they're, they're highly unusual things, right? Beyond their normal range. We have those kind of fish at Catalina. 
because El Nino will have brought them up and there'll be a couple babies and, and one uh, dude and one dudette kind of came up and oh, and they're there. And so they, they have a little you know, home they've made. They generally don't reproduce the same, though. So those guys might come up to Catalina, and they'll, they'll be at Catalina, and they'll maybe, maybe long-lived fish, so they'll be there, but they're just kind of hanging out, right? Not successfully rearing babies. Whereas in some of these thermal areas, you actually get reproduction of these, you know, subtropical species because the, the temperature is there. So we have, so we have, so, so temperature can have strong effects, can make the, yeah, there's other stories I can tell. But okay, good, what else? Other other examples of uh, unusual, what might be considered pollutant, a pollutant. Okay, cool. <clears throat> the two most common categories, I would say, in a management context, right? We can we can always, depending on the agency, depending on the state, depending on the the particular ecological community, we will have various breakdowns. But by far, I would say, at least if we're talking about water pollution, the two biggest breakdowns would be a point source. Uh, 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 excuse me, pollution that emanates from a point source and pollution that emanates from a so-called non-point uh, source or a non-point discharge. So a point source just means something that's coming from an identifiable location. So let's imagine, uh, let's see, do we have any recent examples of this? Uh, uh, yeah. Okay, we just had, what happened in Colorado this summer? Do you guys remember? Right. So the EPA was doing a, a cleanup, or what, they weren't doing it, but they were in charge of a cleanup. They had contractors actually doing it. And they had some, some essentially toxic water, some, some, some highly non-healthy water. It was stored in a berm. It was stored in, a, in an earthen bowl next to a river. And long story short, that broke and that water flo flooded into the river, that, that, that toxic water flooded into the main river and then it contaminated the river. So in that case, if you and I were out kayaking and we were, um, <clears throat> we were kayaking, all of a sudden the river got orange, we would say, hey, well, it's Colorado, so maybe some folks were stoned and maybe they tried to drink it or something, but, but most people would probably look at that and they'd go, oh my God, it's orange. And then we'd probably try to get out of the water, and then we'd say, where'd it come from? And we could walk up the river, right? And we could find the place where the orange or, or the discolored water was coming in, right? So that's a point source. Similarly, a lot of our colleagues in LA have spent a lot of time trying to come up with um, what we would call forensic pollution detection or forensic water chemistry, where we have some contaminant, let's say, let's say fecal bacteria something that's not supposed to be in the water at a high concentration, we find it is in a high concentration. And so they've, and we find this at the beach and it's messing with people and surfers are getting stomach aches and surfers are getting dysentery and stuff like that, right? Oh my God, where is this coming from? Oh my God, it's coming from this pipe. So we go in the pipe and then we follow that pipe. We go up and we go into the, you know, whatever, and we trace it back to um, whatever, a, a poultry processing plant somewhere in, in, I don't know, the west side, or well, it would be the west side because that stuff doesn't exist in the west side, but you know, that kind of thing, right? So we'd follow it back. That's point source. The classic is a sewage pipe. The classic is an effluent pipe coming out of the factory. <clears throat> Most of our environmental laws, uh, this was the low-hanging fruit. The guy that's putting out orange stuff out of his power plant, dude, maybe you should use some different filters, right? And I think we can all agree with that, right? And this feeds into our earlier discussion about why is pollution bad? Because that bastard over there has orange stuff coming out of his pipe. Go get that bastard, right? Go get that person. You get make that person do that, right? <clears throat> so the, the, obviously that, that, that was the most dramatic, those, those are the most dramatic sources of pollution in many cases. They're the, the place where we can do the uh, a capstone and show cl most clearly that this stuff out of this tail out of this pipe is hurting our biological resource. So so easy to track, easy to place blame, easy to target and identify. Also, I would say because it's all that stuff is coming out of one place, the concentration of the pollutant is very high. So the analytical techniques that are that are needed <clears throat> Excuse me. 
the analytical techniques that are required to determine if what the concentration is are pretty simple, pretty straightforward. Don't need a lot of sophisticated technology, et cetera. Okay, that's point source. Non-point source is a whole different ballgame. You are a non-point source emitter. I am a non-point source emitter. CSUCI is a non, well, we're also a point source emitter probably, but, but, but uh, I probably shouldn't say that. Okay, whatever. Anyway, uh, uh, in addition to whatever else we might do, we are also a non-point source emitter. The ag fields that surround campus are a non-point source emitter, right? Depending on what we're talking about in the Santa Monica's, the national park is a non-point source emitter, right? So, so this is a much more diffuse thing. And we, by, so we've mostly cleaned up our, at least in the US, we've mostly cleaned up our point sources. There's still a lot of other problems going on and they're not perfect, but we've made massive progress on this. Non-point source, much more difficult problem. We need, and, and so the point source, in theory, we could go have the sheriff or the game warden. Hey dude, go slap that guy and that guy could put a, a, a closed sign on the factory, we could imagine, if, if it violated something, and we would stop that thing. You can't do that with non-point source, right? It has to be an institutionalized, it has to be a broad-based, it has to be uh, an infrastructure and behavioral response to really get at it, okay? And all those things that we mentioned that made it uh, relatively low-hanging fruit, relatively easy for, for point source um, issues, um, make it hard for non-point source. The concentration of the pollutants are usually much lower than point source. So therefore, we have to use much more stringent, uh, um, um, more precise, let me say it that way, more, more precise chemical uh, analytic techniques. Whereas in the point source, we might be talking about you know, parts per thousand probably, depending on what pollutant we're talking about, but you know, something like that. Whereas non-point source, especially with some of the emerging contaminants, we might be talking about parts per million. We might be talking about parts per billion. That stuff can come from the point sources as well, but, but the point is um, the techniques get much more complicated because the concentration gets a lot lower. Um, and the classic non-point source stuff in the context of water pollution is from runoff from rain. Right, so we have all this stuff accumulating now, next week, two weeks from now. Then we have a big, our first big rain event of the year, and all that crud gets mobilized. And it's coming from Somis, and it's coming from Camarillo, and it's coming from Oxnard. And so it's, uh, it, it's, a, it's a big challenge. Um, let's, let's do a couple quick examples here, and then maybe we'll take a, maybe we'll, we'll, uh, we'll pause here. So, okay, major categories of water pollutants. So, infectious agents. Give me some examples of some infectious agents you guys think uh, in the context of our coastal zone that could be a uh, possible water pollutant. Mm, no, not, DDT, not an infectious agent. Infectious agent would be something that would, it would um, cause disease. So, 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 something like that could cause, like, let's say cancer or something maybe, but, but we're talking about much more short-term Sewage, okay, good. So, so, so potential sewage. Um, so uh, maybe, maybe back the bacteria in the sewage, maybe, right? The bacteria, maybe if you ingested that, it would, it would um, cause you to throw up or, or you to be ill kind of thing. So run off from a cattle farm? Uh, sure, okay, good. So some kind of major uh, poultry or cattle uh, uh, in the case of bacteria. Yeah, so if, if we want to use that, if we want to use the example of bacteria, and we want to use sort of a source of feedlot. Okay, great. Maybe these guys are pumping in a bunch of um, antibiotics, and we're getting some antibiotic-resistant strains coming out. And you get it. Good. There's, there's another. There's another huge one. I would. I would. Yeah. Let's save that one. That wouldn't be pharmaceuticals. Wouldn't be an infectious agent. Uh, algae could be absolutely. Fisteria, something like that. Uh huh. Right, good. So examples could include bacteria. Uh, they could include uh, algae. We could, uh, we suppose we could put all, both those in the, um, uh, the category of microbial, mi microbial um, 
organisms. There's another, there's another big, huge one, another big category you guys haven't hit yet. Infection. Is there any other flu shots this year? Viruses, right. Yeah, so, 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 so um, something that we've, we've very poorly understand, understood as a society, very poorly understand as an academic community, scientific community, but in the last few years, some really exciting stuff has been going on looking at uh, viral diversity in the ocean and viral diversity in coastal zones and, um, and uh, viruses that either are dead or potentially live that could infect you. Okay, good. And so again, the source of that would be, just like you guys said before, mostly it's coming from uh, a waste stream. So uh, a feedlot type waste stream or an improperly treated human sewage waste stream, maybe. Um, uh, so not everybody knows this. Most of the houses in Malibu are on a septic system, right? You think, really? Uh, I mean, I don't know Brad Pitt or where he lives exactly, but you know, you think, really, that those folks have that? And, and the majority of folks, at least on the ocean side of the mountains, on the ocean side of, of Malibu, um, are, do not send their sewage to a municipal treatment thing. So, so you can imagine somebody, maybe they're really responsible and they have a great, a great treatment area and it's all good to go, but there's other folks, like say around Malibu Lagoon, um, that that stuff is leaching into waste is is you know leaching into the coastal zone so we can get that okay good all right infectious agents organic chemicals what are some examples of that uh, well yeah, I suppose although in this case we're by saying organic chemicals we're meaning more chemicals that have carbon in it yeah. So things more, so pesticide would be a classic example here. So pesticide uh, that maybe came from a, I don't know, strawberry field or whatever, right? So, so uh, uh, pesticide would be the example and the source could be agricultural um, production. Okay, what about some inorganic uh, compounds? Um, okay, sure. Yeah, I, I thought maybe that might go in better later, but sure. Okay, yeah, sure. So we could say, um, right, we could say um, uh, some medication you're taking for a, an, a problem you might have, uh, ibuprofen or something like that, let's say. Um, although there's, there's carbon in there, so technically that's organic, but, but um, okay. And so may, that would come from, um, again, maybe in uh, non- properly treated um, waste, waste streams. That's, that's a bit unfair because nobody's, nobody fully knows how to remove ibuprofen from, from uh, waste streams, but, but okay, good. How about radioactive materials? Oh, that's kind of a lame one. I don't know why I put that in there, but right. But radiation. Power plants. Power plants, possibly. Our power plants leak very little radiation. So, so in, in your guys' surveys, when we're talking about the, our San Onofre plant that closed in t because of a, a release in 2012, um, obviously some of the, the folks that are critical of the plant's activities say, oh my God, there's all this radiation that's been coming out. But, you know, not that much has come out. You know, Fukushima, that's probably not good, right? So radioactive materials could be um, from say like the melted down Fukushima plant and the source would be the Fukushima plant, right? Um, but another, another classic example, I don't, I don't think I talked about this yet to you guys, but um, uh, just real quickly, uh, Cold War made a lot of nuclear waste. California has a very popular disposal place for nuclear waste. You guys know where that, historically, where the disposal place was? You guys know where that was? The Farallon Islands off of San Francisco. So we literally took 55 gallon drums through all this contaminated waste in these 55 gallon drums and drove out, you know, an hour or two drive straight out from the um, Golden Gate Bridge and just threw them off the side of the boats. And, and went away. And that was messed up. And we did some messed up stuff. The Russians, the Soviets I should say, uh, they just took straight up nuclear reactors and just threw them in the ocean. 
and uh, so yeah, so Merry Christmas. So those those are those are still there. Those are still leaking. And obviously, depending on the radionuclear, depending on what 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 isotope we're talking about, etc., these things right are hot, are radiologically hot for hundreds of years, dozens of years, hundreds of years, thousands of years, or tens of thousands of years, depending on what we're talking about. So um, okay, great. We have those. Um, what about uh, what's an uh, example of sediment um, pollution? Okay, great. Right. So, so, so uh, lack of vegetation that might otherwise have been there, but humans have done some activity, uh, changed some, some organism distribution, and it's led to some, some bare landscapes. It rains, and it comes and it enters the water through, um, say, coming off the cliff or coming through a watershed. Okay, good. What about, uh, what are some plant nutrient? Uh, uh, examples of nutrients for primary producers. So it's going to be, uh, uh, well, so it's either nitrogen or phosphorus for most folks, for, for most, most things. Right. Uh, if we talk, remember we talked about um, other uh, nutrients in the context of phytoplankton, right? We talked about silica and a, a few of those things, but, but let's just, let's just stick here to the, the obvious ones, nitrogen and phosphorus. So where's our phosphorus coming from, let's say? Uh, sure, absolutely can come from fertilizer, right? So maybe someone is, is putting, is actively putting pellets, uh, you know, time release pellets on their lawn, let's say. But, but, but even, even more so than that, that's mostly nitrogen. So, so that, that would be uh, uh, a good source of nitrogen. Right. So, yeah, so, so. So depending on how they're managing their farms, absolutely, that can be coming off their farms too. Phosphorus, where's the big phos what's the big phosphate source or one of the largest phosphate sources in, in terms of water, water contamination, water pollution? Detergents, detergents. So that would be um, washing your clothes, that would be washing your dishes, I suppose to an extent washing your hair. I don't really have much hair, so I don't really know about that. But 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 really, really, the 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 biggest sources are our our soaps in our our washing machines and dishwashers and stuff like that. Uh, okay, all right, and then oxygen demanding wastes. Um, uh, that would be, what would that be? What would, it be what would it be stuff that robs oxygen, that, that tends to lead to there being less oxygen in the water? Um, it induces algal blooms, right. But what would, what would induce the algal bloom in the first place that would then in turn rob the oxygen? Right. So usually in that case, it's going to be, um, uh, yeah, eutrophication too much, you know, so, so too much nitrogen, phosphorus. Uh, dumping in the water. Um, in some cases, it could be um, total messing with the consumers of those. So we normally think of a, what we call a, oh, never mind, that, 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 that's, 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 that's too far afield. Yeah, okay. Uh, what about thermal? Thermal, uh, what are some sources of thermal uh, pollution? Power plants, right, good, yeah. So. So, so the example would be the water temperature is, I don't know, five degrees Fahrenheit warmer, let's say, uh, in, in these coves, in these little areas. And the source would obviously be the power plant. Now, where do we love to put power plants in the coastal zone? Wetlands. Why? Because we hate wetlands. Everybody hates wetlands. The, the hearing that, that nobody went to a few weeks ago, right, is to put another. Oh, oh Michaela went. Oh, I didn't know you went. I'm sorry. Awesome. Wait, so, okay, let's put a pause. So tell us about, oh, no, anyway, we'll talk when we, when we come back. From, okay, well, let's put a pin in it. I wanna, let's hear from Michaela about the, uh, the uh, exciting, exciting event. But, um, but right, so we want to put a power plant. Are we going to put the power plant in the Santa Clara River? No. Oh, let's put it, let's put it on the coastal zone, right? Let's put it, in that case, you know, kind of near one of the smelly wetlandy places because, hey, it's smelly wetlandy places, right? Of course, shouldn't we put it there? Um, one of the one of the compounding factors in many cases, um, th because we've so 
So yeah, we could put the power plant right in the ocean, suck up the water, put it out. But historically, at least, people um, liked uh, the estuary a bit. Why? Because the estuary is a little bit protected from ocean storms, right? So we are just by the get-go, our pipes are a little bit protected from that big winter swell that might otherwise break it. So let's do it. But what that also means is that the if you do do that and you're discharging water, it's not even being discharged into the big thermal mass that is the ocean. It's the much smaller thermal mass that's the estuary or, or the, the little embayment, right? So it'll still act to cool the water. It'll still do that. But, but it's going to, um, you know, whereas if we dump that straight off into the ocean, maybe it's going to raise the temperature, you know, that whatever that volume is at whatever that rate is, you know, we're, that's going to maybe raise the ocean a degree or two. And that contained it, maybe it's going to take it up 5 or 10 degrees Fahrenheit, right? Significantly warmer. Significant biological uh, impacts would be expected from, from such an a altered uh, thermal regime. Cool. Yeah. Cool. Awesome. So, um, so while that's a thermal, so Michaela's, Michaela's uh, tale there was of, uh, of air pollution mostly and and water pollution, the context of water pollution, that was mostly about thermal pollution. Um, but what I thought we might do uh, next before we continue on our discussions, uh, probably after today, in terms of sediment management stuff, um, or in, ter in terms of pollution, I wanted to um, talk about some sediment management, show you guys a part of a longer video, and then we'll go out and see one of these things um, in place. So if we want to talk about uh, sediment management, one of, the, one of the large spectrum of, of potential pollutants we might want to uh, be dealing with, um, sediment is, is something that's relatively easy for folks to get their heads around, right? We, if we talk about, you know, chemical 1, 4, 5, D, da, 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 get people, uh, I don't know about that, but sediment, everybody can get, it's pretty um, uh, easy to see, pretty easy to understand. And one of the things uh, people do is uh, we do activities that lead to the soil being disturbed. Could be on a farm, could be on a, con uh, a construction, con uh, current construction area, whatever. Uh, and that could mean that when we do have a rain event or, or precipitation, that that s sediment could be mobilized. So the general approach is to, um, is to uh, make sure the soil doesn't move off of the land from the get-go, right? So covered with vegetation, covered with some type of, of cloth, coir cloth, a membrane so it doesn't move. But let's be honest, sometimes things just happen and they do get mobilized. So um, when stuff does get mobilized, let's make sure that we have something that will uh, capture that, that material should it leave our site or, or try to leave our site. And the general term for that uh, in the context of, of stormwater management and stuff is, is a BMP. You'll hear this a lot. So BMP stands for best management practice or, or best management practices. Um, it's, it's, I don't fully understand why this acronym became the thing, because we have best management practices in all kinds of industries, right? All, you know, how, how do you lift the box without hurting your back, all this and that. But BMPs, in the context of water quality, specifically refers to things that intercept pollutants. And most commonly in our part of the world, that is, those are things associated with storm drain, uh, you know, either the parts that go right into the storm drain or the, or the, the, the uh, effluent coming right out of a storm, storm drain. So, um, uh, again, we would ideally like to have good erosion control before we need to get uh, the actual BMP structure thing in there. Um, and uh, also warn people, again, this is, the, this, is the, this is the easiest thing to do, the cheapest thing, the most efficacious, the best thing. So the first thing would be to not let that soil or that sediment get mobilized in the first, ca first case. Next thing, we want to make sure that uh, people... Because I, this probably seems strange to you guys, but you know, back in the '70s, but also in in uh, certain places in our world, people just take that. Uh, ch let's go change my oil, my car. Change my oil. Okay, finish it up. What do I do with it? Just pour it right in the storm drain. 
Um, and so that was one of the uh, major impetus for people doing the, you know, drains to the ocean, dr goes to the river, all that stenciling stuff, no dumping, no oil, that, that kind of, um, that kind of uh, warning to people. So there's obviously no penalty there, but that's more of an education campaign. Um, uh, when we're doing construction, we have sp in, here in um, California, we have specific requirements. Um, so, for example, you've seen all these construction sites where they have water trucks driving around, squirting water on the, on the um, dirt, on, on the denuded soil. And that's because we, we have specific requirements that we're not allowed to create a lot of dust. Either because dust, we're worried about, a, uh, worried about that from a, a human health in, you know, inhalation danger, or because it just messes with landscapes, or in some cases because it creates a hazard, say, for drivers on the road right next to it. If there's a bunch of dust coming, it makes it hard to see sometimes. So um, just like we have re requirements for keeping the dust on the ground, we also have requirements for making sure the sediment stays on site. And um, generally, we're talking about areas that are at least an acre in size, although depending on the situation, it might apply to smaller areas. So this would be a housing development. This would be a shopping mall, uh, that, uh, that type of stuff. Interesting, ag have um, traditional or unofficial exemptions from a lot of this stuff, but that's, another, that's a topic for another class. Um, and so we would get a, 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 const a construction permit to do this stuff, and part of the construction permit say, okay, you're going to, how long are you going to do this? We're going to build these houses for a year and a half. Okay, that's going to take you up into the rainy season. You know, something like a month before the rainy season, you need to go in and do X to make sure that when it does rain, you have these BMPs installed. The rule of thumb, you should all write this down, the rule of thumb for us in California, October 15th. October 15th is the... The, the rule of thumb for the beginning of the rainy season here. In most years, under most conditions, the rains in a significant way do not begin before October 15th. So in many cases when, for example, if we're looking at a construction permit, what you would see is they would say by, well, definitely by October 15th, they'll probably say by October 1 because they want you to have it ahead of time, but you know, by mid-October, you should have everything locked and loaded. If you're going to have vegetation growing, you want the vegetation growing. If you're going to want to have coir cloth down, that all needs to be stapled down and good to go. If you're going to have uh, structures on the drains that we'll, like, we'll go see in a second, um, uh, that needs to be there uh, by you know, early October. And so here are some of those uh, mat, uh, measures to control uh, sediment and reduce sediment pollution in coastal waters. So one, we have something like this, which is called a silt fence. Now a silt fence is a semi-permeable structure. So when we look from afar, it looks maybe like it's pure solid plastic. It's not. It's essentially a weave of plastic. And uh, and, you know, there's different types of silt fences depending on what, uh, what our context is. But right here, let's have a look at this picture. Here we have uh, the parking lots up here, and, and they're obviously doing something here. And so this is higher elevation, this is lower elevation. If left unchecked and it rained, this, this sediment we picked up, roll down the hill, I guess, boom, go into this uh, uh, depression here, and then go straight to the drain, uh, the storm drain. So we've put this structure up here so that if it does rain, um, it, it's going to be caught here. And how silt, felt, fe silt fences are supposed to work, little teeny tiny, uh, you know, little like pinprick holes so the water can, in theory, go through, but at least the majority of the sediment, the larger particled part of the sediment runoff, would be retained right, right uh, on the other side of this black fence. That's a so-called silt fence. In this case, we're showing a, a erosion blanket. So this is something that is, it could be plastic, it could be made out of coir or coconut fiber, whatever. This goes down and this guy is, this guy is attaching this because here we have some, in con some construction site again, just like outside of our new building right here, we have the same exact thing. We have this stuff going on and uh, 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 we don't want it to run and mobilize. Maybe we're waiting for the seeds to germinate. Maybe we're going to do some more construction in a few months. 
So the idea with this is this allows the water to, in theory, move to the soil, penetrate the soil, go down into the, recharge the, the aquifer or whatever, does all that good stuff. But it would be very hard, at least for the larger particles of soil, to move with this. Okay, and then we get to the BMPs that I want to show you guys in a few minutes. This would be, um, uh, uh, okay, so here is where the uh, liquid on the surface of this area would run to, go into this area, and then from here it would connect to the storm drain system and go to, let's say, the creek, Cayuga's Creek or whatever. So what we've done here is we've come in and we've put a new material in. We, we've put, uh, so check it out, it's all old and skanky, right? Like my office. And so, and so it's cracked. Now check it out. There's all these places where stuff can move in and out. So these guys have come in. They say, ah, this is not good. They've cut this. I can tell they've cut it because see this straight line here? That someone has taken a, a cement saw, a stone, uh, um, a, a rotary saw to cut this. They've cut it. They've made it nice and crisp. We've poured some new concrete or put some new material in here so it's nice and tight, right? So we don't have a lot of gaps. And then uh, we've come in. And then we have uh, added some uh, materials. Uh, it could be absorbent materials. They could be semi-permeable materials. And now what's essentially going to happen is when the water runs into here, before this water goes into the major storm drain network, it's going to have to pass through what it amounts to a filter. And it's going to pull out that sediment, those particles of sediment, and leave that in this uh, uh, filter media. And then the water that's going through will be comparatively clean. Uh, these are uh, a similar idea that we could do this if we maybe didn't have a storm drain here. We could put the same material up. We could make a wall of these things that would sort of serve the same, um, same purpose. So again, we refer to all these things as BMPs in the context of stormwater management. But in particular, uh, BMPs are, are, are most uh, diversely spoken of when we talk about the types of things that go over the filter that would be at the entrance or the exit, especially the entrance to the storm drain system. Okay, and again, and now this might look like a point source for you, right? Because this goes to a pipe, but really we're talking about the, the, but the source of the material is coming from all of the area around this, um, this site. So it's a non-point source. There isn't one single pipe that's generating the sediment. It's coming from this whole large swath of an area. OK? All right, great. Um, I'm going to leave uh, my computer here. And we're going to go on a little walk. So I want to go show you guys um, uh, so, uh, the outside area of our building here. And then we're going to go on about a five-minute walk up to look at one of our new BMPs we just installed. Um, all designed to minimize pollution here at CSUCI. <laughs>